You guys ready to geek out on Airbnb technology? I hope so, because that's exactly what we're talking about today with Colin Tate here on the Fearless Investor Podcast. Hey, welcome into the Fearless Investor Podcast. You're listening to me, Kyle Stanley. And one of the things that we talk about actually on this show today with Colin Tate is technology. And if you're not already using this piece of technology, you're completely missing out. It is Price Labs. And you can get your free 30-day trial plus an onboarding uh, training with Price Labs. If you're watching on YouTube, it's just on the link down below in the description. Or if you are listening to the podcast, just go to fearlesskyle.com forward slash Price Labs, and you can go ahead and jump on that, get the free 30-day trial. Why would you want to do that? Well, it's because you can earn a lot more money by using a dynamic pricing tool like Price Labs that will price out your properties based on supply and demand and more occupancy. So more money, more occupancy, and a lot less headache because you're not having to manually go in and price things. I was manually pricing things for the first two years. I can't believe the tens of thousands of dollars that I was leaving on the table. So even if you just have one listing or a hundred listings, you should be using a tool like Price Labs. Now, with that being said, it is a piece of technology, and that's exactly what we're talking about with Colin Tate today as we're talking about the ultimate tech stack for how to be able to automate a successful Airbnb business. Colin has been in the uh, short-term rentals games for a few years now. Uh, he also coaches students, but he also is um, just really big on the software side of it and how to be able to utilize all these different softwares, knowing which ones to use. There's so many out there with uh, Airbnb and the short-term rentals game. So how do you know what to use? Well, we're going to talk about that right now with Colin here on the Fearless Investor Podcast. Colin Tate, live here on the Airbnb Masterminds page, and we're talking about the STR tech stack for automating success. Colin is the author of the host coach uh, book on how to be able to invest in short-term rentals. And I cannot be more excited about having you on this uh this show today and also live in our Airbnb Facebook page, Airbnb Masterminds Facebook page for that matter. And I uh, can't wait to hear some Q&A from the, the fans as well. But Colin, thanks for being here, man. Yeah, I'm pumped to be with you and your group. Awesome. So really quickly, you're coming from Washington, D.C., right? Yeah, man. All right. Do, do your short-term rentals exist there or are you somewhere else? Yeah, there, we're about two hours outside Washington, D.C. Okay. in the Shenandoah Valley. Okay, cool. So I know you've got a, a handful. So and I know you've been doing this for a while and you've been helping a lot of other people. What's what's the craziest Airbnb story that you've either been a part of or maybe heard from uh, one of your students? I guess my my craziest project was um, I bought a uh, bought a four bedroom cabin from a wholesaler and I knew it needed a little work. And uh, but it turned out that we ended up digging a uh, it took about six months. We ended up digging a uh, 700 foot well because there was no water to the property oh and there was had about a 700 foot driveway that i had about 20 contractors tell me that it couldn't be built and i was on the verge of having to to sell a property and i i think it's the craziest because it took the most work and taught me the most about perseverance and you know just just pushing on and, and i learned the most from it Good. I, I like I like a story that turns out to be a learning situation. We we've had plenty of those with renovating properties as well. But um, Colin, I'm excited to talk to you today and especially geek out on some some technology because Airbnb and short term rentals are famous for that. But um, guys, as you're listening in here and you're watching on the Airbnb Masterminds page, post your questions. Maybe you've got a question about a certain technology. Maybe you've got a question about what technologies to use. Maybe Colin's going to go ahead and mention one of them and you haven't heard of them and you've got more questions. I encourage you to post questions, say what's up. We'll give you a shout out as we're going along here. But Colin, take us back before Airbnb, before, you know, even being in short-term rentals, what were you doing and what did life look like? So I've always been a, a tech entrepreneur, Kyle, um, founded and uh, co-founded several, several companies, um, from electronics manufacturing to software as a service, uh, name change company with my wife, a nonprofit service oriented uh, company. I've done some venture capital type stuff. Um, founded the uh, world's largest uh, network for entrepreneurs called Co-Founders Lab, which is still around today. Cool. Wow. So you, you've always kind of been in the, the software side of things. Um, and and you, you had told me before we jumped on here, you sold a business right before Airbnb is and short-term rentals too, right? Yeah, I, I owned a, um, a getaway cabin 
that uh, my son was about five at the time. And anybody out there that's got kids in that age range knows that you're just looking for somewhere to get away, somewhere to have something else to do, right? And uh, I had put that up on Airbnb and it, it, it did really, really well. And then on uh, 2018, I'd sold a company. I was 48 at the time and just scratching my head and thinking, you know, I have to spin something else up, start all over and build another, you know, what's the next million dollar idea? And the easy thing was sitting right in front of me. Yeah. And, you know, I knew the, I knew that there was good money in the short-term rental market. And so I leaned in and uh, ended up actually buying three properties that summer of 2018. Nice. And what was that business that you were running and, and sold before? So in 2018, the business that we sold was a uh, company that helped nonprofits um, process paperwork that they needed to pay, uh, process for registering uh, to take donations in states. Cool. So it, it sounds like you've done a lot, a number of different things, you know, b- before Airbnb. Have, have you always kind of been that serial, you know, like uh, I don't want to necessarily call it serial entrepreneur, but kind of is the serial entrepreneur. Is, is that kind of been the lifestyle for you? That's, I've never had a W-2 job. Nice. <laughs> there you go. Which, you know, has its pros and cons, but then you hit 48 and you go, I got to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what attracted you? I mean, I know you said you had the cabin, you were doing, doing it on Airbnb, and then you decided to kind of take it to the next level. But what was it about short-term rentals that had your eye? Um, and, and maybe even a better question, when you have transitioned from one business to the next, what are some of the things that have really attracted you to want to start that next business? You know, since I was a teenager, you know, I was always presented with that idea of like, where's the deals for our generation? You know, mm-hmm. we've heard those stories, you know, I, I, I related back, you know, had a friend, you know, they have the beach house, you know, $42,000 beach house, or they bought this lot, or I invested in this company. In my whole adult life, I, I always scratched my head and said, you know, where, where are those deals for our generation? And it just sort of hit me that Airbnb is that opportunity for our mm. generation. And so I jumped on it. Awesome. And I want to know a little bit more about your area. Before we start getting into the tech side of things, yeah. your area in Washington, D.C., Un, not unlike a lot of different areas across the, the country that are cracking down a little bit more on short-term rentals. Sounds like you were able to finesse your way into maybe a place that was a little bit further away from Washington, D.C. Yeah. So how are you making that decision on where you were going to start your business when you did decide, hey, it's time to go from one to five to 10 properties in this business? You know, I think I lucked into the location for my first property in that it was a cabin in an area that I personally wanted to be. Mm-hmm. But as I started to understand the market and understand, you know, how the real estate investment investing part of Airbnb works, it turns out that within a couple hours drive of a- every me- major metropolitan market in every state, There's places where people have traditionally wanted to go to get away. Where would you get away for a long weekend, a holiday weekend, a romantic weekend? Where would you want to go with buddies to go fly fishing or, you know, go mountain biking? So those areas exist all around the United States within a couple hours drive from everywhere. That's awesome. Yeah. And and that's, to me, if you want to get started in short-term rentals and there is somewhere like a a Washington DC or, you know, Pittsburgh just had some regulations come down and, and you're not willing to go and do that, that next drive, two hours, three hours, maybe even a plane flight away. Then I just don't think that you're ready for this business. So it sounded like you were, you know, you, you, like you said, you lucked out, but I'm pretty sure that if you were to get any regulations coming down in in your area, uh, would you, would you pivot? How would you handle that? You know, I think that's a, a secondary benefit of those types of areas. You know, when you get outside of the urban area and you get into these getaway destinations, you know, these these places have been that way for a long time, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, pick a lake, a mountain, a river. Um, and in these more rural type communities, I think that um, they're more appreciative of the tourism dollar and yeah. the and the revenue dollar. Yeah. So the, 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 the downtown area has never been where I have, looked to for, you know, the best return on investment. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what, why, 
why is it today that you know you really are excited about talking about tech when it comes to to the short term rental side of the business? I think because a lot of people miss that piece of it, right? Um, I get asked all the time, "Well, is it too late?" You know, it seems like everybody's jumping into short term rental investing, um, and I think most people that are jumping in are jumping in by just you know taking some photos of a place and putting it up on Airbnb and leaving it at that. When there's really a lot of things that can be done through technology to set yourself apart. Awesome. What, what's your favorite piece of tech when it comes to this business? My very favorite piece of tech would probably have to be Price Labs, which is a third yeah. party dynamic pricing tool. Good. Yeah, yeah. We I actually um, have a great relationship with the CEO of Price Labs, and we we're doing some uh, tips of the month with Price Labs. Actually, I, I love love what they got going on. Um, what what is it about? You know, have you used other ones besides Price Labs? Have you used the Beyond Pricing and the Wheelhouse? And you know, um, I, I think I looked into one of them. Um, I also have a, a property in the Caribbean. And early on, I looked in one of those other alternatives. I'm sure they all work in a very similar way, or, um, but it just wasn't available in the one market that I investigated. And I've just been so happy with, uh, with what Price Labs does for me. I you know, haven't, haven't dug further. Awesome. And uh, guys, yeah, with, in regards to Price Labs, if you're not using it, you need to be using it. Uh, feel free to comment here if you want to get started. We've got a free uh, trial link, 30 days, along with the onboarding training. Um, I, I think anyone that wants to be using any, you know, especially just getting more income on your property, reducing the headache that you have with your properties, it's, it's a no brainer. Um, so let me ask you this. Did you start using something like a price labs right away, or did it take you a while to discover it or to get convinced that you shouldn't be pricing yourself manually? It took me a year or two. So I had that first cabin that I just sort of put on Airbnb on a whim because, you know, it was there and available. And then when I, when I bought the other couple, then it was time to, you know, dig around and can't even remember how I found it uh, exact, you know, initially, but as soon as I instituted that, I think I went from like, you know, immediately from $4,000 a month to $6,000 a month in cash revenue in that one property. So it was, I mean, just 50% increase with a very small investment. Yeah, you know, I was using a competitor's um, right out of the the gates, at probably about four or five months into my business. And I was convinced that because I stopped getting bookings, I was like, I'm convinced dynamic pricing is messing with the Airbnb algorithm. And I banned it from my, my business for okay. like two years. And then when I got to 35-ish properties, I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't keep manually pricing this stuff. I need to figure out what is going on with like, maybe it was a user error. And I, I transitioned to Price Labs at that time. And ever since then, we've, I mean, we've legitimately seen 20% revenue increases in the majority of our properties just because, I mean, you, you think about it, man, like you just, you just don't think about that one weekend where there's a festival and 50% of all the other properties have already been booked up. And, you know, that's what Price Labs is doing there, a dynamic pricing tool to help you with supply and demand. And, and that's what I love about it is like, I would have never thought to price my stuff that high, or I would have never thought yeah. that this is low demand. So I need to drop it down low. And um, I, I love that tool for sure. And the next part of it that I think a lot of people miss is it's not just getting, you know, an extra $200 a night on a weekend. It's also sort of the SEO benefit. Right. So not everybody, you know, probably the first thing that I tell people is think about any of the OTAs, right? Airbnb, VRBO, it's a search engine and it has to make a decision on which property to just show in what, or, what order. And a lot of things that Price Labs does helps with that search placement. So, exactly. you know, you're filling in your weekdays with lower prices and you're updating your listing more frequently yeah. and your, um, creating higher occupancy. So all of those things, you know, are, are really strong benefits to feed into your rank placement in addition to just getting an extra, say $200 a night on a festival weekend. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that I like about Price Labs too, is if, if you actually implement a discount, it will show on Airbnb with that line across it of like, this is what it usually costs, but here's the actual cost. And everyone loves seeing that they're going to get a discount or a deal, especially if it's last minute. Um, 
couple comments here. Unless Colin, did you want to say something on that? No, go ahead. Okay, cool. Couple comments here. Jake Cohen says uh, Price Lab is the bomb. New minimum <laughs> night rules are amazing. Totally agree with that. Eliana says I'm using Price Labs, but I'm having some issues for a week. Uh, been having issues for a week or two with the syncing of Price Labs. I don't know what to do. I uh, don't have a number to call. So Eliana, I will tell you if you uh, email Price Labs with their customer support, which is right there on the platform, they're amazing with getting back to you. But just make sure that in regards to syncing that you're actually physically going in there and clicking sync. And if you're using a channel manager, sometimes if you've gone in there and changed things with the channel manager and overwritten uh, price labs, it'll actually unsync price labs. So make sure that you go and check on your channel manager if you are using one. Um, so Colin, let's, uh, let's, let's get back to the whole reason why we're talking is it's this, uh, you know, idea of tech stacking. And I know you've got some, some pillars that you believe in that are just really good for, um, you know, the overall operations and starting of the business. So I want to give you the floor to start talking about that. Uh, yeah, the four pillars is just a, a framework for success that starts with um, finding your where. So a lot of times people ask me, you know, what's the, you know, what's the hottest market? What's the best market? What's the best ROI? And, uh, you know, I tell them to not look at it that way. Don't chase the crowd. Find where you're passionate about. And then once you've identified a place like that, then we can start to dig in to the data, you know, with AirDNA at an aggregate level. Again, back to Price Labs, I'm really a big fan of their new market dashboard where you can look instead of at an aggregate, you can look at like exact revenues for properties like yours. So I think mm -hmm. those two tools used together um, are you know, sort of indispensable in deciding you know, your revenue projections and making an investment in a place. So that's kind of the where. Um, let, let, me, let me ask a question about that. So one of the number one things I hear people say is, you know, hey, I live in, let's just call it, I don't know, Mississippi. And I would love to start a short-term rentals business in Houston, Texas. It's like, okay, I got it. Do you have, do you have any reason why? No, I just really love Houston, Texas. <laughs> okay, do you have any connections there? No, not really. I just think it would be really a good place to go. So I believe what you said for sure in terms of passionate, but I'm also a believer that you've got to have some sort of feel for this business before you actually go in and just you know blindly go into a random area that might be a $500 plane flight away. And before you know it, you're there every weekend because you know you don't know what you're doing. So do you fall more in that line of like, you know, hey, it needs to be, realistically operational or do you fall more in line of like no just go for the passionate place and you'll figure it out i guess when i say passionate, i mean find a place first of all that's near you that okay. you can be excited about right cool. so where do you like to go where would you want to take your spouse or your friends or you know i was doing a presentation down in south carolina i didn't know anything about the amenities in south carolina and i literally just did a google search best weekend getaways in south carolina you know, and it came up with winery areas, uh, you know, national park areas, hiking areas, river areas. And then from there, well, if I'm a hiker, you know, the beach area is not as exciting to me, right? But if I'm, you know, a fly fisherman, then I want to, you know, maybe go to that, that trout stream area. So that's sort of what I mean about find a place that has gravity and demand as a location, but then you also, you know, um, you know would be excited to spend time and tell your friends about. Cool. And so whether you're using AirDNA or Price Labs, whichever one you'd like to use, you know, what are maybe some uh, KPIs that you would look at, some key performance indicators of that area that would make you say like, okay, yes, this looks good, or mm, it kind of looks iffy. Maybe I want to look at a town next to it or, or a little further away. You know, I first start with, um, you know, what the prices are of the, the properties. You know, that's a big, big one right now because prices are going up. So I like to kind of see price per square foot, you know, under $300, you know, in that sort of 150, 200, 250 um, price per square foot. Cause I'm a big believer in not just finding an area that's already being used, you know, properties that are already being used as rentals. That's kind of my issue with the beach. Hmm. You buy a beach place, you know, it's, the house might be $200 a square foot, but the land's you know, $200 a square foot because it's at the beach because it's being sold with that rental role, that rental revenue baked in. So I like to find areas that have 
been historically used just as single family getaways mm. and then transform that into a fully operational Airbnb. Cool. So hence why you really like the, the lake and cabin areas. Correct. Cool. All right. So first pillar is where, what, what do we have next? The next is uh, make it pop, right? So that's your design and decor. We like to be really clean in our interiors, but the tech part of that is HDR professional, you know, real estate photography is an absolute must. Mm -hmm. You know, people, you know, when you buy a house, you look at the pictures, then you go see the house. When you're booking an Airbnb, those photos have to jump off the page, right? That's how you're going to get the clicks on your listing. That's going to drive your search placement. And people are booking just on your photography. So I think that's very important, if not a complete must. Awesome. And when you talk about, you know, the, the professional photos, um, how, how many, I think this is a big thing is <laughs> how many photos, because I think there's such a thing as not enough. And I think there's such a thing as too many. So do you have that down to a, a system? I don't, I would consider my view on that more art than science, you know, and, and I know there's definitely some experts out there that have firm beliefs on the numbers and I, I wouldn't argue with any of them, but we, we tend to put up about 20. Cool. And that no matter what the size of the place is. Yeah, because you're really trying to capture, you know, what's unique about it, which, you know, what's the location look like? What are your macro amenities? You know, if you've got a hot tub, you've got a nice shot over the hot tub. If you've got, you know, nice views, you want the views. We try to go with really clean, crisp interiors. We say cabin rustic on the outside and crate and barrel on the inside. Very cool. Guys, as you're watching in here, we got a, a decent size uh, crowd here listening in. So if you have questions, we're talking with Colin Tate. He's the author of the Host Coach book on how to invest with short-term rentals. Um, we're on now pillar number three. So we just talked about define your where. Uh, now we just talked about the professional photos. What is that third pillar? Uh, and, and we'll actually, the second one was really making it pop. Make it um, pop. Is, is, is there anything beyond the professional photos of making it pop? Is it anything that you want to talk about in regards to the amenities or the design or anything along those lines? You know, you be creative. You know, it's not really a tech solution, but um, there's a lot of things that you can do to make a short-term rental, um, you know, that you wouldn't necessarily take risks in your house. So a quick story, we were painting the outside of this cabin and my wife wanted to we paint it like a dark blue, medium blue. She's like, let's paint the door yellow. It's like, I don't want a house with a yellow door. So this, well, it's not your house. Let's try it. If, it, yeah. if we don't like it, then we painted this, you know, it's the yellow, we call it the yellow door effect. You can take risks and we painted the outside of this door yellow. And now people call it like the yellow door place. You know, it's memorable. It sticks out. It looks cool. Do I want a yellow door in my, my house at home? Probably not. But at this cabin, it looks great. I, I have one with a pink door and I was so worried that like no male would ever want to book this place with a pink door. But I mean, this thing is booked all the time, makes great money. And so you just go, it goes to show you that, you know, those things that stick out, whether it's a block in your mind or not, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the guest. Exactly. Awesome. Uh, Scott says, what about an accent wall? Yes or no. We are near a hospital. So there's not, it's not really a vacation area. Haven't launched yet trying to decide. Big fan of accent walls. We usually do kind of like a gray neutral or something like that. And then pick a color, you know, big pop of blue, you know, on one wall and then maybe some pillows and stuff uh, that match that. But yeah, big fan. I've got a client who does a, always does these big red, bright red accent walls. So anything to grab people's attention like that, make it unlike their home. You know, and, and I'm not going to go into to this because I just don't have enough information about it, but I've been in a few masterminds and they talk about this rule of red and how uh, a, the color red just makes people stop and pay attention, which is totally opposite of what I would think. And I actually talked to, to my wife about this and, and she's an interior design. She's like, yeah, it's kind of opposite of what I would think too, because the, the uh, color red typically invokes uh, some sort of, you know, like uh, feeling of anger <laughs> where, but, but you know what, I'm sorry. Now it's kind of one of those things. Now that I've heard it, I'm like, I do notice that a ton of these like really high performing listings, that first picture, or at least the top five have some sort of drop of red in there. And uh, there's, there's gotta be something to that. I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, something worth looking into. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, pillar number three, what do we got here? Uh, pillar number three is price for occupancy. You know, so we talked about using um, price slabs to you know, set our pricing dynamically, 
We talked about getting those high rates, you know, um, further out, you know, maybe there's things going on that we don't know um, what's happening. You know, there's a festival or event, you know, all of a sudden you're getting four, five, six, eight hundred dollars a night. Um, that's well and good, but we also need to take a look at the near term occupancy. And this is something that I talk about that not a lot of people do, which is I really think the price tools do a great job in occupancy, but I take a real close hand in say the 15 day occupancy, right? So looking out from now to the next 15 days, I was just doing it before we got on the call here to make sure that I'm manually, you know, one of the features in price labs is we can go in there, we can subtract, you know, less a fixed amount, right? Less 10%, less 15%. So I'm very aggressive in every couple of days, making sure that I'm feeding the price labs tool to take those prices down because I want to be 100%, 95% occupied, not just to get that room night, but to feed the algorithm that I am providing a listing that can close the sale for Airbnb. Yeah. And what I, what I really think that everyone needs to think about when it comes to this is if you go unbooked for a night, that's money that you can never earn again. And so I think there's this balance because there's a lot of people out there that talk about like, oh, if you're 95 to 100% booked, then you're underpriced. And then there's other people that will say, well, if you're, you know, if you're not at least 90% booked, then, you know, you're, you're again, leaving a lot of money on the table. I think there's this balance of it's right in the middle of about 80 to 90% where it's like, okay, I got this, this weekend booked and it's probably booked about 20% higher than I would have been able to book it. But then there's maybe one or two days, you know, right around it that don't get booked because of that. And there's this kind of balance, I think, that we have to like look at. Of it's it's not quite a hundred percent, but it's also not quite like fifty percent. Uh, where where do you kind of fall in that? So I like to be um, about twenty five percent booked sixty days out. I like to be about fifty percent booked thirty days out, and then in that fifteen day range, I just jump in there and manually, you know. Um, and manually discount to get those occupied. So you, I absolutely agree. You don't want to be 100% booked, you know, three months out, you're definitely leaving money on the table. Yeah. But I just manage that real near term bit to to make sure that we do fill the calendar. Awesome. I love it. We have a really similar approach for sure. Um, and, you know, in Price Labs, there is something that I mentioned that you mentioned, um, do you use the customizations, the advanced customization of that occupancy uh, based adjustment, or do you just like to do that manually on your own? So one thing I also do is I think that, at least in my market, um, I do a plus 15% for the shoulder Thursdays and Sundays. I feel like people tend to want to, you know, steal those Fridays and do like a Thursday, Friday type of uh, booking if they don't want to pay that high weekend rate. So I think there's a kind of a third category that that maybe the, the uh, dynamic pricing models look at like weekdays and weekends. But I look at that sort of shoulder day in the middle, the Thursdays mm. and Sundays, and I do a plus 15% across the board as a customization on those. And that works really well to keep people from stealing, you know, um, a Thursday, Friday night to avoid a Friday, Saturday night. I, I really like that. I actually hadn't uh, heard that yet. Um, Lynn just asked, what about last minutes with promotions? Yes or no? Last minutes with promotions. So, you know, my last minutes are, are literally, I'm looking at any occupancy I've got open over the next, you know, you know seven to 14 days and I'm doing my own promotions yeah. there. Um, I don't take, you know, I, I generally don't respond when people say, you know, I don't like your price. Can you offer me a lower one? Mm -hmm. Generally don't respond, you know, in, in affirmatively to that. I generally like to just want to set my own discounting. Okay, cool. Uh, one more question here from Scott before we move on to the fourth pillar. Uh, he says, what about that 20% discount when you're starting a listing? Do you go for that? So I help a lot of people start their listings as an Airbnb ambassador also. Um, I tend to turn that off but then go in and work with them to do our own manual near-term discounting. You know, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 15%. You kind of have to sometimes look at the numbers and see what you're comfortable with, or maybe start it, you know, um, 
it, it's more a matter of discounting not the first three bookings. It's more a matter of discounting that near term vacancy. You know, people have longer to see a listing in three weeks from now and better chance that it's somebody's birthday or wife's birthday, right? So I, I look more at discounting in, in the near term weeks and days as opposed to the next three bookings. Okay. It seems like Airbnb has also gone from five you know, reviews to show to, to something like three now. I, I, I haven't seen that. that. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and have you seen that on mobile or on the desktop? I just, I just launched one of my own properties about two weeks ago when I was kind of waiting for that magic. You know, usually it's always been, you know, where you think of let's get five reviews and then they start to show. They started to show for me at three. So I'm not sure if that's a change in the algorithm. Airbnb has definitely changed some things. Uh, I, I've noticed a few of my students that have just gotten started. They're launching their first listing and they get a notification from Airbnb saying it's under a review for the next 72 hours. And, and that was something I wasn't used mm -hmm. to seeing. In fact, we just launched our first listing in the last month. Uh, we hadn't launched anything in about a month. And for some reason, it was live for the first two days. And now it's like been removed. It still says oh, wow. listed. Yeah. And we've never seen that before. So we're having a conversation with Airbnb right now to try to figure that out. But it seems to be more uh, nuances now with starting a new listing. I don't know if you've noticed. I used to have people go in and set their calendars to really high rates because literally in a launch call, somebody would get a booking, right? Yeah. But now it does seem like they really have put a like good 24 hour hold on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and what about the fourth biller? So the fourth one's one that's I uh, really just kind of stumbled upon in the last year that I think is a huge game changer, especially for established hosts. Have you uh, worked with Rank Breeze at all? I, I have not used it myself, but I've seen uh, some other coaches use it and it seems very user-friendly. So the neat thing, so I always say what gets measured gets managed, right? Yeah. And as hosts, we might be able to see how our bookings are going. We might be able to see how our views are going. We might be able to go into incognito mode and do a search and try to understand where we're showing in, in list and rank placement. But Rank Breeze, um, yeah, it's a subscription software, just like Price Labs, it's very inexpensive, um, will monitor your listing for you for all your available upcoming occupancies over a different number of guest stays, say two, three, four, five, six, and tell you exactly where you're placing, where you're ranking in Airbnb rank placement for, for that available weekend. So what that allows us to do is if we're down in the number 20 spot off the first page, we know that we need to make adjustments either to our policies or to our pricing to try to increase that rank. And we've also never ever been able to measure, well, what if I, you know, if I, instead of reducing my price, I'll tell a quick story. So I have a condo in Turks and Caicos nice. and all of a sudden it had fallen into a poor rank placement. Actually, it had, wasn't booking much. I applied rank breeze to it, found that it was in a poor ranking placement. I don't have the ability to discount below a certain rate because there's a management company. So I went in and systematically started touching everything and changing policies, and I could watch which things resulted in higher search placement. Wow. So this gives us, as really, you know, kind of experienced hosts, a way to make sure that we're moving up and we're where we want to be in a search placement. On the other side of that, it also allows us to see that if we're commanding a lot of authority, if we're always in, you know, number one, two, three spot, and it's just always there, it gives us the confidence that we can raise base price. I, I love that. And I ha like I said, I haven't used it myself. We've had our own backend systems of how to be able to track ranking and, and our team knows how to be able to use like just the Airbnb insights in order to try to figure out that the best, but it's something that I've had on my horizon and something that I think I definitely need to check in on. And I think that's, what's great. You, you just mentioned it, all these, Airbnb, all these, you know, technologies for the short-term rentals industry it's wild how inexpensive they are and allows us to be able to you know really uh integrate some amazing technologies to operate a much higher level and everyone could be doing this but i feel like most people just don't even know about them or don't even know how they would even attack it so um I, i'm i'm amazed that these things are priced as low as they are i agree yeah so with with Rank Breeze, just going back to that for a second, 
when did you start using it and what kind of results um, have you been able to see? Have you actually <sighs> been able to like notice, hey, in the past, I would have not been able to figure out how to get through this, but because of Rank Breeze, I was able to, to surpass yeah. through it. And just as a disclaimer, you know, I'm no, no affiliation. I just sort of yeah. stumbled upon them at some point. Um, I mean, that story about the place in Turks and Caicos, um, I would have just struggled and scratched my head and not been able to change. You know, I, I was blaming it on COVID, on you know, travel restrictions, but I was able to go in and systematically make changes and touch things on my listing and put it to the top without, cha- without touching price at all. Right. So a lot of people will sort of say, you know, everybody's going to, you know, the more people get involved in Airbnb, we're just going to all price to the bottom. Right. Um, I don't think that has to be the case, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a great story where I was able to do everything except price and go from, you know, page six back to, you know, page one or you know, number one on page one. Um, I also use it to help monitor for people I, I coach, you know, put their listings in. If all of a sudden I see somebody's dropped, you know, they're all on page three or four, we'll jump on a call and do some, you know, optimizations of policies and, and Airbnb's always come out with new settings, you know, new opportunities to click things off, um, and it helps 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 us know when it's time to do that. I like that. Uh, good question here. What's an ideal rank? Is top rank maybe uh, meaning that you're priced too low, or do you want the top rank? In my opinion, you know, you. And here's another thing. It also really illustrates how variable your property is over a different number of guests searching. Hmm. So for example, I have a two bedroom, I have a lot of two bedrooms that will sleep six because there's also a pullout, Hmm. but they don't rank well for six guests. Hmm. They rank great for two and three guests. They don't rank because Airbnb knows that I'm not closing. You know, when someone plugs in six guests and they don't pick my property, then Airbnb doesn't show me as well for six guests. So there's some really interesting nuance on how two bedroom, three bedroom, and four bedrooms vary over guest counts like two, four, and six. And one thing that I, I came across recently is the least variability is the three bedrooms. So I have two, three, and four bedrooms. People will, a couple will book a two bedroom. A couple will book a three bedroom. A couple won't book a four bedroom. So a three bedroom actually has the less, the least variability in rank across that, you know, two, four and six guest um, range. But I don't know if it really answered your question. Your question was. Yeah, no, I, I really like that though. And it actually brings up another question for me, but the, the question was, is being the top ranked, uh, like number one ranked, is, is it possible that's a bad thing? So first you have to start with what is your target number of guests? Yeah. Right. So let's say it's four. Um, I'm, and, and people will debate this, but I'm of, I'm of the belief that if you're not on page one, you're, you're not in the game. Hmm. So at a minimum, you've got to be page one, you know, one through 20 for your target number of guests, right? If, think about it. If you Google something, how often do you go past page one? Not often. Average Airbnb, um, you know, guest hits what, like four listings? So if you're not on page one for that target number of guests for that open available weekend, you're not in the game. So then the, then the question becomes, how hard do you fight to be in the number one spot? I think in you in the top 10, you know, I, I have a lot of places that are in the same geography. So I'll have a three, a five and a seven, you know, something like that. Um, I think that's okay. If you were consistently pegging, you know, number one, then that tells you it's time to go in and take that base price help tool and price labs, see where you're at, see what it suggests, and maybe you can command a higher base price. I love it. Awesome. Last question here, and then we're going to get ready to log off, but do you know of any competitors to Rank Breeze? Have you used any? None that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay. That I was trying to think about that too, and I have not. Rank Breeze, I just heard about a couple months ago, and that was such a, a new, unique uh, concept to me. I didn't think that there was another one out there. Um, so man, Colin, awesome stuff here. I love talking about technology, but if people want to continue to connect with you, learn from you, what's the best place for them to do that? Yeah. Uh, my website is hostcoach.co and there's, you know, 
blog information in there, information about our background. You can contact to set up um, complimentary coaching. Um, the book Host Coach is available, uh, paper book, hardback, and uh, audible here in the next week or so on Amazon. And then if you'd like to follow along our Instagram, we do kind of a behind the scenes on our own renovations, which is just at host underscore coach. That's awesome. Colin, thanks so much. Uh, is there any last words that you have for our audience before we say goodbye? No, guys, keep crushing it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colin, uh, Colin for being on uh, the show and helping our audience to conquer the world of Airbnb. Show notes for this one, fearlesskyle.com forward slash Colin Tate. Colin is C-U-L-I-N-T-A-T-E is Tate. And so what, what I just really want to point out here is if you're not using technology, you're really not a short-term rentals host. Like you, you might think you're doing things perfectly, but I'm telling you, you're missing out on not just time because this is saving you a lot of time, but you're missing out on things that the human mind cannot figure out on its own. I cannot go in and use a tool like Price Labs without actually using a tool like Price Labs. I can't go in and every single day know, well, hey, 50% of you know my market is already booked on this day unless I were to literally go in and click listing by listing and, and do some numbers. These types of tools are doing this for you. And it's so inexpensive to use things like Price Labs and Rank Breeze and Air DNA, and even ones that we didn't even mention, hospitable and channel managers that should be able to allow you to completely remove, you know, not completely, I guess about 80 to 90% remove yourself from the business. So go in, start using some of these technologies. And I hope today helps you to be able to conquer the world of Airbnb. We'll see you next time.